So uh, yeah, goals of this presentation, I really hope that by the end of this, you guys have a good understanding of the state of woodland caribou in Western Canada. So mainly Alberta and BC. Uh, you have a firm grasp of what those threats actually are that caribou are facing and a understanding of what management actions have happened or not happened and how, you know, what are the expectations for caribou recovery uh, in Canada. And hopefully you get to know a little bit more about CPAWS. I actually don't talk a ton about what we do, but maybe at the end, if you guys have questions about um, the job and how, you know, goes fit into this, I'd be happy to talk about that. So just more broadly, uh, global the global biodiversity crisis is, uh, you know, <laughs> not unique to just Canada, of course, is across the world. Um, species declines we're seeing everywhere. Uh, this was a Living Planet report that came out in 2020 um, that basically said that Canadian wildlife losses are actually fueling a lot of the extinction in the world. Um, it reported that Canada basically is a large contributor. Uh, so some of these stats, uh, the populations of Canadian species that were assessed by CASIWIC, which is the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, um, they've declined by almost 60% over about 50 years. So those are species that are important to Canada. And then also um, from a global perspective, species that uh, have been threatened or are assessed as you know, very important globally have also declined uh, very significantly. Um, and I just wanted to add that also from this report, it notes that there are five cumulative threats on average that face each of these species. Uh, so those threats, you know, are like climate change, overexploitation, energy, pollution, invasives. So uh, there's a lot that these species have to deal with. And these declines, there's something happening, <laughs> uh, something happening with their habitat a lot of the times that are uh, causing these declines. Uh, so one place in Canada that has experienced a ton of change is the boreal forest. Uh, it's definitely faced its fair share of habitat and landscape alterations. Um, some people call it the green ribbon that stretches across coast to coast. Um, it takes up a quarter of Canada's landmass, so it's a huge um, ecosystem. There's 270 million hectares of boreal forests in Canada, and they're made up of wetlands, swamps, bogs, meadows, forests. So it's not just the trees uh, that make it the boreal forest. Um, and then it also includes all the rivers and um, lakes that tie, tie it all together. Um, and a large part of the boreal forest is wetland uh, and wetlands absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, so it, it helps combat climate change. Um, what's really cool is that the boreal forest stores a lot of its carbon uh, underground in its soil. So kind of an image on the right where a lot of that carbon is in the bog, in the soil, decomposing. Uh, and that's what soaks up all of the carbon. And it's actually almost twice as much as what's stored in tropical forests, uh, just underground and in like in tropical forests. And so they store carbon for thousands of years, but that doesn't mean that just because it's so important, uh, it's not seen its fair share of development. And in Alberta, you know, NBC, uh, there's been decades of some pretty intensive industrial activities in our boreal forest uh, and really affects it in a myriad of ways, not only species declines, but also affecting ecosystem functions and water quality and things like that. <coughs> so these are all the kinds of, um, you know, anthropogenic disturbances that happen in the boreal forest. So of course there's many natural disturbances like wildfires and pests, um, but there's also a lot of these human activities. So uh, things that cause habitat loss and fragmentation from 
roads and uh, the energy industry through exploration, but also active operations, um, you know, infrastructure and sting and pipelines. And this is actually occurring at a scale that you don't really see anywhere else. Uh, so these are a few pretty interesting papers uh, coming out of research labs that look at uh, basically the slight use disturbances um, and the satellite imagery of them and how you can quantify them. And so they did a bunch of work and you can actually see these landscape disturbances from space. And this is a quote from one of these papers, the top paper uh, that says, today rates of anthropogenic disturbance exceed all other disturbance sources in some regions of the boreal forest that are associated with intensive forest management. The cumulative area of anthropogenic disturbance in the boreal forest as of 2010 was estimated at 23 million hectares of disturbance. And the image on the right is what the boreal forest looks like, uh, you know, an aerial imagery. So <clears throat> you can see, can you see my mouse, sir? My mouse, my cursor? Can you yes. see it? Oh, okay. So these are uh, well pads. They're all the roads to get to the well pads. So you can see they kind of intersect everywhere. This is um, a cut block. Few, um, you know, a few cut blocks up here on the left-hand corner, uh, and then roads, and then these kind of more faint crisscrossing lines, those would be seismic lines. So those are what um, the energy industry uses to explore for uh, potential oil and gas, potential underground. So it's kind of lots of things on top of each other. And so <clears throat> one of the reasons that we know our boreal forest is pretty badly damaged uh, is because of the species decline. So in particular, woodland caribou. Um, and woodland caribou are an indicator species for the boreal forest because of the very specific needs that they have uh, and the specific ways that they use the boreal forest. But you can see even in this map that their range, which also extends kind of in this ribbon across the country, um, overlaps pretty well with the boreal forest. Uh, and so you kind of get this indication of what's happening across the country based off of how caribou populations are doing. So now I'll get into a little bit of caribou ecology the, the fun stuff. <laughs> um, so there are caribou all throughout Canada. Um, there are generally kind of four subspecies. It kind of depends who you talk to, how many subspecies there are. But um, there are Piri caribou, porcupine caribou, barren ground caribou, and woodland caribou. Um, so often when people think of those really numerous populations, those herds in the kind of Arctic um, that carry out those massive land migrations. Um, that's probably barren ground caribou that you're thinking of or that people are thinking of. Um, and barren ground caribou do carry out the longest land migration of any species. So they travel hundreds of kilometers to reach their calving grounds. Um, and that's because of the ecosystem that they live in. Uh, so woodland caribou are found in the boreal forest. And so they don't have to carry out those massive migrations because they actually have, you know, forests and mountains and wetlands to um, evade predators in. Um, in the news lately, if you've seen things about um, like the Arctic refuge and how, you know, there was an executive order that Biden just signed to close that sale of um, leases to porcupine caribou herd. Um, so that's kind of that bright yellow in the upper left. So there's lots of different subspecies of caribou. And then to make it even more confusing, there are ecotypes for woodland caribou. So there are boreal woodland caribou and there are mountain woodland caribou. 
Uh, and each of these subspecies, they have differentiated by, uh, you know, appearance, genetics, behavior, um, expert knowledge, uh, and Kasiwik, which I mentioned. So I don't know if you guys have talked about Kasiwik before, but Kasiwik is this committee of experts in Canada that basically make recommendations to the Minister of Environment about what species should be listed on the Species at Risk Act and also kind of how they're managed. And Kasiwik has recommended, and this has been adopted by um, Canada, to um, distinguish all of these, all of the caribou in Canada by what's called designatable units or DUs. Um, and so that's what has happened. Um, well, I won't get into DUs, but know that there's lots of differences and there's a lot of nuances. Uh, so caribou <clears throat> are the best ungulate in my opinion, but I'm very biased. So they're a member of the deer family. So that's what ungulate means. Um, <clears throat> they're kind of have a stocky body. They're larger than deer, but they're smaller than elk and moose. So often if you hear people who like go to the Rocky Mountains or go to Jasper or something and say, oh, I'm so excited, I saw so many caribou. They definitely are probably seeing elk. Um, and you can, can just kind of ask how big they were and if they're like, yeah, they're pretty big. Definitely elk <laughs> who are like noticeably small. Um, they have a white neck, white bum. Uh, they have um, a dewlap and there does change depending on what subspecies you're looking at. So the, the caribou that are higher in the Arctic um, are kind of this more white, uh, lighter color, kind of like the uh, image on the left. And then woodland caribou tend to be this darker brown uh, all over their body, like the caribou in the, in the right image. And they're very um, distinguished by their feet, which are very wide proportionally to their body, pretty rounded. And that's for helping them walk on top of snow, but also walking on top of wetlands through bogs so they can stay on top, kind of like how lynx have really big feet. Um, and what's really cool also about caribou is that they're actually the only ungulate and males both grow antlers. Um, so males, uh, they drop their antlers before the winter and, you know, it's for sexual selection mating. I mean, like, I, I don't actually, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of research into what they're actually for, but I would assume that's what antlers and everything else is for. Um, so, and they're pretty distinct. So the uh, image on the right is a male caribou with like these huge antlers. And female actually, they keep their antlers through the winter um, until the calving season. Um, and it is thought that female keep their antlers because they can use them to dig through the snow for lichens. They have really high energy requirements um, if they're pregnant and they're um, going to calve. And so what's cool about that is then caribou are the same species as reindeer. Um, it's just that reindeer kind of have a more uh, domesticated history. Um, and so it means that Santa's reindeer and all the imagery of antlers. So it means that it's this team of like badass female caribou. And, you know, last point on caribou is that they also have really good noses. They have these broad snouts and they sniff out lichen, which is uh, their primary source of food, um, sniff it out in the ice and the snow. But then in the summer, they also eat grasses, sedges and mushrooms, things like that. So British Columbia and Alberta have woodland caribou. And then as I said, woodland caribou have two ecotypes, a mountain and boreal. And Alberta and BC is pretty cool. They have both of them. Um, I couldn't find a map of both Alberta and BC that have all of the both ecotypes on it. So you can imagine that the Alberta map fits in perfectly with the BC map. Um, but 
Alberta is pretty straightforward. We have boreal caribou in that green hashed um, and then mountain caribou in that blue hashed, uh, you know, obviously around the Rocky Mountains. BC, a little bit more complicated. <laughs> Again, with the nuance. And believe me that when I was getting into caribou, I wanted to like pull my hair out. It was so confusing to me. BC is bananas, but what they did is they took Southern Mountain and actually there are also differences in their behavior and their genetics amongst the Southern Mountain caribou populations in BC. And so they actually split them into three groups of the Southern group, Central group and Northern group, um, which you can see here, the green is the Southern group, that kind of pinky coral is the Central group. And then the orange is a northern group, not to be confused with northern mountain caribou, which is the purple. <laughs> um, and then the boreal caribou are, are in the blue, <clears throat> which you can see those boreal caribou in the in the blue in the upper um, northeast. Of the sea. They have that overlap with Alberta. And so there is that movement between the two provinces. And you'll also note, I don't have a map of the Northwest Territories on here, but they do cross into the Northwest Territories as well. And some indigenous knowledge um, suggests that, it, you, well, they describe it all as it was one herd and then kind of as more disturbances happened and the populations have gotten smaller. They are kind of separated into these smaller herds now, but used to carry out these pretty big movements from Alberta, BC, and Northwest Territories. Um, <clears throat> but pretty awesome that BC has this many caribou. I don't think a, a lot of people don't really realize how spread out they are and how much they cover the province, um, but they are everywhere. Um, and I just want to note that what the map on the BC side doesn't um, articulate is that many of those herds, so, you know, these are the delineations for all of the different herds that they have, the names for all of them. Uh, a few of those are extirpated, which is a local extinction. So it means that there aren't any caribou left in that herd anymore. Um, so you might, rem again, in the news, uh, the South Selkirk, the South Purcell, those were like pretty high profile extirpations that happened, um, I think in 2019. But there's also kind of spread out in that whole area are a lot of other extirpations. There's no George Mountain herd anymore. Um, there is no Purcell Central, um, Burnt Pine, Monashi. There's a lot of extirpations. Um, and then on the Alberta side, not immune that either one of the jasper herds has been extirpated as well so one of those blue ones uh, and so the thing is that we're lucky to have these this this really iconic species in our provinces um, and they're not doing well <laughs> and there's a lot of data that shows that they are not doing well and so this is an alberta context there are 15 woodland caribou herds uh, on provincial lands in Alberta. So there are two in Jasper that Alberta doesn't have to report on. Um, and as I said, they're boreal and southern mountain caribou. Um, population estimates for the herds vary from about 55 animals to 400 animals. That's really on the high side would be 400. Um, and none of them are naturally self-sustaining. So none of them uh, will stabilize on their own or grow on their own. And it means that it, without intervention, they will all become extirpated. And that's, um, that's from the federal recovery strategy, this that natu not naturally self-sustaining um, descriptor. But there's tons of data in Alberta. Alberta's, uh, I talked with one scientist that said it's, it will be one of the most well-monitored e extinctions <laughs> on the planet. But um, one 
study that came out in 2015 estimated that the herds in Alberta are declining at about 50% every eight years. So about half every decade. Um, and as you can see from the figure on the slide, it's they're, they're pretty drastic changes. Um, some herds have declined over almost 90% of their herd has disappeared. And not to say that Alberta hasn't known that they're declining, uh, woodland caribou were first listed on Alberta's Wildlife Act in 1985 as endangered. And it's pretty evident that not a lot has changed. And it's a pretty similar situation in BC. So there's a lot more caribou. There are 54 herds or subpopulations in BC that consist of a lot more DUs. So as I said, the, they have Southern Mountain, Central, Northern Mountain and Boreal. Um, and also, as I mentioned, there have been some like, pretty high profile herd extirpations. Um, at least seven of those herds have disappeared in the last 20 years. Um, this is an image of a caribou from the South Purcell herd. Um, that happened in 2019. There was only it was only one or three caribou left in that herd. And so they decided to locate it. They airlifted this caribou into um, the maternity pen in, in Revelstoke. And that was essentially the uh, extirpation of the South Purcell herd because they were functionally extirpated at that point, meaning like if there was no way that they would um, breed and come back. So to really understand where these declines are coming from, um, it's important to take a step back and understand how caribou have adapted for the boreal forest and for the mountains. Um, and I'll talk about here, this is specifically for boreal caribou. And then on the next slide, there's like a little bit of a difference with mountain caribou, which is, you know, the reason that they are different ecotypes. Um, but for boreal caribou, uh, there's kind of three points that I want to make. So woodland caribou, so I, this is for boreal and mountain. Woodland caribou, they naturally exist at pretty low densities. They're like a pretty rare, rare species and they're very slow to reproduce. They will never have twins. They only can have one, one calf at a time. Um, and they even calve in isolation. And so it, it's just a, they're, they're slow to mature. They're, um, they just, they can't really bounce back from high disturbances in the same way that you might think white-tailed deer or moose and things like that can, uh, can bounce back. Uh, so woodland caribou and boreal caribou in particular, they depend on very old parts of the boreal forest. So they need to be really large pieces of undisturbed old growth um, and coniferous forests. And they also use wetlands. Um, and the reason is not only because that's where lichens grow, which is what they primarily eat. Um, it also is very unattractive to other predators like wolves. Um, that don't want to go into wetlands because it's hard to move through them. But also old growth forests are not productive. You know, they don't have grasses or early cereal forage that attracts other ungulates, like other prey. Um, and so wolves just don't really have a reason to go into those kinds of uh, habitats. So kind of like a really good at hide and seek. They just hide in those areas. The other things don't want to go. And then they eat lichens, uh, which are found in higher abundance in these very old forests. And so, you know, that kind of sets them at a disadvantage where it has to, it takes a hundred years for an old growth forest to become at a point where it's growing in a, uh, a lot of those lichens. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of these rare, rare habitat conditions. Jillian, could I ask you a question that came up in the chat? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, I can't see the chat. Oh no, no worries. Someone said um, when you were talking about the one that was removed, um, is it the Purcells or the Selkirks and went to Revelstoke? Um, Eva is asking, was that individual or the last few incorporated into another herd once it was extirpated? So what does the 
pen at Rebel Stoke do? Yeah, so the maternity pen, uh, it houses females and uh, especially the pregnant ones. And so I think the cows, they just keep in that pen right now. Uh, and so, yeah, they would be incorporated into, I don't know what herd the maternity pen releases them into, but it would be, yeah, they would be a part of um, a different population now. And basically they're just in the maternity pen. Um, and I, <laughs> I think a big question when it, with those extirpations is always, oh, so, I mean, are there plans to reintroduce that species back into that area? Um, and that's something we can talk about in, the, in like a discussion later on, but uh, it's there, there is some direction in the federal recovery strategy that that should be an intention, but at the same time, it is also viewed as once caribou have disappeared from an area that you can then also go in and uh, log or explore or you know, disturb the habitat because there actually aren't any species at risk there anymore. And so at that point, then maybe there's no value in reintroducing an animal to that space. Uh, and so there's just a little bit of a nuance um, when it comes to mountain caribou, different than boreal caribou. Um, so boreal caribou, really stay within their range. There isn't a lot of movement there um, year round. They're in the wetlands and in those forests in the old growth stands. Mountain caribou, on the other hand, are a little bit more mobile. Uh, so, and, and how mobile they are depends on what um, group you're looking at. So kind of, uh, it depends on the way the snow behaves uh, as you move farther north um, the snow it tends to be um, more shallow and not like deep snow habitat um, so more southern mountain caribou they'll um, spend all their time in, in subalpine habitat um, where they eat lichens um, that grow on the trees in the winter so they actually can stand on top of the more deep snow and get the lichens that are higher up. Um, as you move farther north, more central group, those southern mountain caribou, they'll move, uh, they kind of have elevational migrations. So they'll actually move to lower elevations in the foothills where they eat ground lichens, they kind of crater for ground lichens, and then move back up into the mountains um, for calving and for the summer. So as you can imagine, <clears throat> again, it's a strategy, an anti-predator strategy. So wolves don't go up into the higher elevation areas. Uh, and so if you're uh, calving and then housing, um, so kind of in that summer, you want to be farther away from those predators. So they move uh, into those more alpine areas. And then northern mountain caribou, they'll move between summer and winter ranges too. Um, and what's really cool I think, is that mountain caribou actually share some genetics with barren ground caribou. Um, so some uh, genetic studies have been done recently and they think that that's why they're kind of predisposed or have learned to do these kind of mini migrations like elevational migrations in, um, the in, in that boreal caribou don't necessarily have that strong elevational migration. They still have some movement, but not as distinct as mountain caribou. Um, and I also just wanted to note that that strategy also still varies within those herds. So there are some central mountain caribou herds that don't move. Uh, they, they don't go down into the foothills. And part of that is because when their herds get so small, they'll just stop doing the migrations because it's just not uh, beneficial anymore. And so sometimes, you know, again, another indication that things are pretty bad um, is they'll spend kind of all their time in this more alpine mountainous habitat, uh, even in the winter. And kind of a side story on that, there used to be a caribou population in Banff National Park. Uh, and what happened is 
those caribou um, started spending all year on mountains in the more alpine areas. And what happened is a avalanche um, ha- uh, ca- actually killed the entire herd. And so, you know, so consequences to spending all your time in the alpine is, is kind of uh, environmental, you know, random events can really have huge impacts. So then the question is, okay, so they have figured out these really great strategies. That's awesome, differentiated from all of the other ungulates. Um, and are they still successful? Well, not really. <laughs> so because woodland caribou naturally exist at those low, low densities, their low reproductive outputs means that they're really sensitive to changes and to mortality events. Um, and so, uh they're just the they're especially sensitive to those kinds of disturbances and they can't really bounce back in the same way um so they use those really large tracts of old growth forest well undisturbed habitat patches they're coming smaller and smaller a lot more fragmented in the boreal forest so it means they're not really able to move as much and avoid predators they need a lot of space um and then those high levels of disturbance can also affect movement of predators. So uh, wolves can benefit a lot from different kinds of disturbance features. And they and they kind of end up in caribou habitat a lot more. Um, and uh, those disturbances have also really benefited other prey species like moose and deer. Uh, and, and so an increase in those populations kind of ends up having a negative effect on caribou as well. And then they eat lichens and lichens are, you know, their old growth forests are also very valuable lumber. And so there's a big with uh, a forestry industry that wants to, that, you know, reduces a lot of that uh, food availability. Um, and in their, especially for, um, oh yes, I remember what I was going to say. And then also with human disturbances, um, caribou tend to avoid areas of high human activity and human disturbance. And so then that could mean that they're avoiding areas of high quality habitat. So even if an area does have a ton of lichen, it is really good. If it's right next to like a pipeline, for example, they, they won't use it. And so that could be really negative. And then particular in the case, particularly in the case of mountain caribou, um, so they use those different elevations to avoid predators. Uh, what has kind of changed recently is that loss of disturbance in the foothills, um, you know, means that it's maybe not beneficial to do those elevational migrations anymore. And so there's a little bit less movement, like I said, with the Banff example, um, but also um, human recreation activities can also bring predators into that alpine habitat or into the subalpine habitat, uh, especially in the winter. So wolves usually uh, can't move through the snow very well, at least not as well as caribou can. Um, but if there's something like a packed trail from backcountry skiing or anything like that, or uh, snowmobiles or plowed, plowed roads, like for instance, in the national parks, that's a really big issue. Wolves will just travel on the plowed road and then they kind of, again, end up in caribou habitat where they're supposed to be avoiding these predators. So it just kind of exposes them to higher encounter rates. So... I guess to say that there's a lot of things that have happened in the boreal forests and foothills that kind of tip the scales out of favor for caribou. And they likely interact in a lot of different ways and they have resulted in a lot of behavioral and demographic changes. And this I took from a report that's by the federal government um, that kind of just talks about this, this general interaction of disturbance and caribou declines. So I'll just read it. So it says forestry, oil and gas exploration and mining and mineral exploration and development, hydroelectric development and tourism all negatively affect boreal caribou 
and mountain caribou. These activities affect boreal caribou and mountain caribou <laughs> through a combination of direct and functional habitat loss, decreased habitat quality and development of linear features that cause fragmentation. And this final piece kind of gets at the mechanism for this. So human induced habitat alterations have caused an imbalance in the predator prey relationships resulting in unnaturally high predation rates. So all of the data, when they look at the caribou declines of like what's really causing this, like most immediately, there's a really consistent uh, evidence that it's really high predation rates. So in, in an overwhelming number of cases of what has caused caribou mortality, it is predation rates and very high predation rates. And so there's been a lot of work uh, to try and figure out the mechanism for those very unsustainable predation rates. And it kind of has evolved over many years. There's a lot of different other behavioral changes that have maybe happened, um, responses to, uh, you know, wolf movement is a big one that comes up, but I really wanna focus on one that a paper came out yesterday, two days ago, that looked at this and it was just a really good paper and it's very compelling evidence that apparent competition, uh, I mean, which we've known apparent competition is a really, really big driver, but it, it, it does add a lot of um, support that this is one of the strongest drivers for what has caused really high wolf densities, which is really bad for caribou. Uh, so it's apparent competition. And if you're unfamiliar with what apparent competition is, it is when there are two individuals or two species that do not directly compete for the same resources, but they do affect each other indirectly because they share the same predator. So in this case, I'll use moose as an example, but um, deer, depending on kind of where you're looking at, it could be deer as well um, or uh, another kind of prey, but uh, in most, in a, in a lot of examples, especially in BC, uh, moose are the primary prey for wolves. Moose and caribou don't directly compete for resources because moose eat, uh, you know, early cereal forage like grasses, shrubs, and caribou eat lichen. So they don't actually compete for the same resources. But changes in moose populations do affect wolves. Um, and that in turn affects caribou because the higher there, you end up getting higher wolf populations, higher wolf densities um, because there's a lot more moose. And if there's a lot more wolves, there's a lot more encounters with caribou and it really affects caribou pretty hard. I think what's interesting and what is good to emphasize is that caribou are not the primary prey for wolves. So this was a paper in 2016 that looked at wolf diet and biomass of their diet. You can see that almost half of a uh, wolf's diet is com composed of moose and actually less than 5% of what wolves eat is caribou. So they're not even, <clears throat> it's not even that there are more wolves and wolves are, you know, going out and hunting caribou. They're actually um, opportunistic uh, hunters when it comes to caribou. So it's just if they run into a caribou, um, they'll predate it and take it down. So um, because of all of those kind of, you know, physiological uh, characteristics for caribou that I mentioned earlier, like the really low reproductive rates and the small population sizes, even though they're not a primary prey, they're really disproportionately affected by this high wolf predation. Uh, and so caribou populations will decline at a certain when wolf densities get too high, basically. So then the question becomes, okay, well, like, there's kind of that's kind of one piece of parent competition, what is creating these really high moose densities or what's creating, you know, high deer densities. Um, and the evidence would suggest that it's habitat alterations. Um, and so there's tons and tons and tons of research that has looked at how the, those disturbance features in the boreal forest affect caribou, but also how they affect other prey. And so 
uh, you know, when you see in that bottom left image, that's those are like cut blocks, uh, which is a pretty intense kind of disturbance throughout BC and Alberta. Um, so those cut blocks, basically you, you know, you wipe everything out in an area and what grows back first are grasses and shrubs, early cereal forage. So what it's called and moose really uh, benefit from that. They're attracted to those areas. They also eat a ton of it and it boosts their populations because moose can um, really increase quite, quick, quite quickly. Um, and so those highly productive areas, they don't benefit uh, caribou because again, caribou eat lichens. They don't really gravitate to those highly productive areas. Um, but they do benefit moose, they benefit deer. And so this is kind of the mechanism you can see on the right here where the, the logging or the habitat alteration uh, benefits moose, which means there's lots of moose, which means that wolves become very popular or a lot more numerous because there's so many moose to eat. And then that ends up being really bad for caribou. So uh, wolf, density increases as a consequence of moose densities increasing. Um, so this was the paper that just came out a few days ago. They actually, um, they took a ton of empirical data across Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and Northwest Territories, and they found that once wolf densities are above 1.8 wolves per 1,000 kilometers, the caribou populations will start to decline. Um, and that, that wolf density, is influenced by moose density, which is influenced by habitat alteration, basically like how much disturbance is in an area. So these are the cascading effects of forest cutting that destabilize traditional predator prey dynamics, and it's at the detriment of caribou. And then I just wanna also em uh, emphasize that there are, are so many other compounding interacting effects that are happening too um, and it's kind of different depending on where you are in the country and for mountain caribou um, they're also really negatively affected by you know when we're talking about that predation and like why are predation rates so high another piece of the puzzle <clears throat> for mountain caribou are our human activities recreation activities um, so in the winter, wolves can learn to get into, to access alpine habitat, subalpine habitat, um, using packed tra trails. Uh, so that can be from backcountry activities like skiing or snowmobiling is a really big one. Um, and even snowshoeing um, uh, can, can provide enough of a trail for wolves for them to use it. Um, and it can bring wolves into the places that caribou are trying to avoid them. And you can't really outrun a pack of wolves um, and wolves respond to the trails like almost immediately wolves are super super smart um, there is lots of data from Jasper National Park they monitor they have all of their wolves collared in the park and they have they monitor a lot of their caribou as well um, for a long time and they and they can look at the uh, collar data on wolves and they can see how quickly wolves uh, will change their behavior to move on to a plowed road or move on to uh, a packed trail. So there are areas in Jasper that are closed in the early winter for uh, from recreation to protect caribou. And there have been instances in the past where people have either unknowingly or not gone into areas that are closed to snowshoe uh, in a lot of the the examples are snowshoeing on foot, I believe. And so they'll, you know, hike on foot up to a lookout or something in Jasper and then come back out um, where a conservation officer, or, you know, something is waiting for them <laughs> to find them. Um, but they looked at that data and within two days, wolves had uh, started using the trail that that Two, that those two snowshoers made um, right in, in caribou habitat. And that happened a few years ago and it was also within the range where the, that herd is now extirpated. And so it's just to say that there's <clears throat> a lot that happens and 
Uh, I don't I don't think it means that we can't recreate in the backcountry anymore, but it does mean that there has to be a little bit of caution about when and where those activities occur. And that's, I think, you know, speaks to a lot of this is like, okay, we understand the declines, the mechanisms, what's happening, the impact humans have on caribou. So then how do we manage those impacts? And so, you know, this is a wildlife management course, right? So let's talk about management. I'll, I'll go through um, what has, how, how caribou management has kind of played out in Canada. So <clears throat> I'll start federally. So in, in 2003, woodland caribou were listed on Canada's Species at Risk Act. So 2003 is the year Sarah became a thing. So they were like one of the first species on it <clears throat> for a very good reason. And <laughs> under Sarah, once a species is listed, uh, the federal government has to come out with a recovery strategy. And I laugh because it's, it's their own act <laughs> and they didn't, the federal government often is challenged to follow their own act. Uh, so under the federal recovery strategy, I'm pretty sure it's within five years, Canada has to produce a recovery strategy. You can see that the recovery strategy for boreal caribou didn't come out until 2012. And that is also only, I mean, I'll say only, but it is in part because in 2010, uh, there was a lawsuit where um, <clears throat> I believe a, a few environmental groups and First Nations sued the, uh, the Canadian government for not following Sarah and for not producing a recovery strategy. So that came out in 2012. Uh, and then in 2014, two years later, the Southern Mountain Caribou recovery strategy came out. So they had to make two different ones because of those like significant differences in how they use their habitat, their range, right? So you kind of have to think about more about those migratory movements and different elevational habitats for mountain caribou. And also to just note that in 2014, Kasiwik designated Southern Mountain Caribou as endangered. So they were threatened. And on Sarah, they're considered threatened. Uh, Kasiwik was like, <laughs> Southern Mountain Caribou are down bad right now. <laughs> we have to, they're endangered, which means they're at imminent threat of extinction. Sarah, the federal government has yet to adopt that uh, listing, even though Kasiwik is like, they're definitely about to disappear. Uh, in 2018, there was an imminent threat assessment completed by the feds uh, for Southern Mountain Caribou. So uh, they were basically compelled to uh, analyze how bad is the situation? You know, how the, the imminent threat is for, uh, they're supposed to judge if they're an imminent threat of extinction or not. Um, and if there is, it actually would trigger something called a safety net order or um, uh, yeah, safety net order, which means that the feds come in and basically like take over everything. Um, they completed that imminent threat assessment. They said that they weren't at uh, risk of becoming extinct, but they were at risk of not recovering. <laughs> and then in 2020, so last year, a conservation agreement was signed between B BC and Canada for Southern Mountain Caribou. And so I include those listed because they are all tools that are under SARA. Um, so a conservation agreement is something that you can enter into under SARA. The imminent threat assessment is something that can be triggered under SARA. Uh, and the recovery strategies are under SARA as well. So basically what happens is uh, once a recovery strategy is made, it then becomes the province's responsibility to create range plans or herd plans. Um, so basically it's like out of the federal government's hands uh, once, once the recovery strategies come out. The recovery strategies, they provide objectives, they provide guidance, they provide like here are the targets for how you have to now manage your caribou populations. Um, and 
as you can imagine, like it wouldn't be, I mean, can you imagine in Alberta if like the feds had to come in and take over like a caribou range and say, well, we're just going to manage it. It would be horrible. It would be Wexit all over again. So they, you know, they said, okay, it's up to the own jurisdictions to figure this out, uh, you know, make it happen. So then when it comes to what management of caribou look like within all those provinces and um, for the uh, Northwest Territories as well, uh, it all comes from this document. Well, I'll go through both of them. Um, I think they're, they're, they're super important. They're super important. Um, probably one of the most important documents for caribou. So the objective for the recovery strategy is to stabilize and achieve self-sustaining populations. So they have to be stable or they have to be growing. And as I said, for instance, in Alberta, none of them are self-sustaining. Uh, I haven't checked for BC. I didn't go up through all 54, um, but the Southern Mountain Caribbean and BC are generally all very bad. I would assume they're all also not self-sustaining and the Northern Mountain Caribou are doing a little bit better. Um, but also still at risk. And what's also important is that the strategy um, identifies the habitat that's necessary for survival or recovery of the species. So that's also what's called critical habitat. So that's a term, that's like a legal term that comes up a lot too. So they include maps in the recovery strategy that actually uh, maps out what is considered critical habitat in Alberta the entire range for boreal caribou is critical habitat. Um, and in it's, it's a little bit different for Southern mountain caribou, which I'll kind of get into, but uh, then what, what they have to do is the recovery, recovery strategy has to figure out an objective or a target that actually takes into account what are the drivers of caribou declines. So this is from the recovery strategy um, that in any given range, so across Canada, remember that they have to make this for across Canada. So in but habitat disturbance reduces the suitability of adjacent habitat. It increases the rates of predation. It increases access to the land for hunting opportunities, and it can act as barriers to border terror movement. So what they did is called, they did a scientific assessment um, they kind of tried to pull together all of the data that they could, um, and they needed to, dis to determine a disturbance management threshold, and that, that's their wording. So what they did is they modeled po population trends from across Canada for all of the ranges that had population data, uh, and they modeled it against disturbance levels. And they said, you know, is there some kind of, is there a predictable trend? Is it a strong model? It's a very strong model. Um, there's a very, very strong relationship between disturbance levels and population dynamics for caribou. And so based on these models, uh, it was determined that a range needed to be 65% undisturbed habitat to have a likely outcome of population growth. And I won't like, bore you with what those models are. You can go read the scientific assessment if you want <laughs> of uh, kind of the details of it, but it's important to note that the 65% is a minimum requirement um, and that what the federal government considered to be a likely outcome statistically is only a 60% chance of becoming self-sustaining. So 60% is like not a great odds, like <laughs> those aren't good odds, I would say, but it is what they went with. And so a 65% undisturbed gives that herd 60% chance of becoming self-sustaining. So this 65% number, very big deal, but like that's the target then in all of, in all of the ranges in Canada. And then, okay, so then you're like, 65% undisturbed. Okay, so then, uh, you know, if I'm a province, I think, okay, I have to quantify what's disturbance then. And so the feds in this recovery strategy provided guidance on what should be considered disturbance. And what they did is they decided that there would be a 500 meter buffer on all disturbance uh, features. So 
cut blocks, linear roads, and they decided that the 500 meters, that's what represents the combined effects of increased predation that comes with these features. And it also uh, accounts for the general avoidance that caribou have uh, to these features. So I just included this diagram here to kind of visualize this. So on the left-hand side, this is a road or a linear, uh, maybe like a seismic line or something. And so then, when you do your modeling, you put 500 meters on either side of it. And so all of this, you know, a kilometer wide counts as disturbance then when you're doing, uh, when you're doing that accounting of how disturbed is uh, a range. And then you do that for cup blocks as well. And of note, you don't put the 500 meter buffer for wildfires. So the Southern Mountain Caribou Recovery Strategy that came out in 2014, so two years later, it's a little bit different. I won't go too much into it, but it's just important to note that the, it is a different document and they actually define critical habitat differently for Southern Mountain Caribou than for Boreal Caribou. And they split it into, uh, within critical habitat, they call it core habitat. It's the exact same reasoning. So it's, it's habitat that has to provide support for life history requirements. Um, so basically the same thing, it has to provide for survival and recovery. Uh, for Southern Mountain Caribou, because of the nuance of the way that they move, they divided critical habitat into high elevation winter range, low elevation winter range, high elevation summer range, which is like, again, very overwhelming. If you feel overwhelmed, I was overwhelmed. I'm constantly overwhelmed by this. And then they also include matrix habitat. So that's the habitat that is in between the core uh, that is sometimes used by caribou, but that does that that is used by by prey and predators. And so it does have kind of um, these like overflow effects on uh, the critical habitat. And so just to oh yeah sorry. Sorry, Jillian, I was going to say we got a question about that buffer in the chat. Oh, Can yeah. I ask you? Sure. Um, Ariel is asking, you mentioned earlier that they do have a lot of avoidance, even if it's good habitat, if it's near a disturbance. Is that 500 meter buffer effective? Mm. Which is, a, I feel like, a loaded question. That's a really good question. Um, it, it, so I would say that there is evidence that the caribou can avoid different kinds of features at very different scales. So there is some research that suggests, you know, they might avoid it five kilometers, they could avoid it 14 kilometers. Um, and it, that depends on what the kind of disturbance is. So um, I would say it is a conservative buffer. Uh, the reason they went with 500 meters, I suspect, and you'll see this, is because if they went higher than 500 meters on either side, it would be nearly impossible to meet 65% undisturbed threshold in a lot of ranges in, in Canada and especially in Alberta and BC. So there's no point setting something that's impossible to meet. And I don't know the politics that happened behind that, but I can tell you that personally in the processes that I've been a part of, that 500 meter and that 65% comes up a lot. Um, and as something that's contested and as something that, you know, what we shouldn't even bother trying to meet it because it's like impossible. And so I think there was a lot of kind of political uh, kind of accommodating that went into that number. I don't think that it's necessarily reflective of how much caribou avoid an, a feature, but I do think that kind of at a cumulative effects level, it does do the trick enough. And, and from a management perspective, it does the trick to um, do its best to capture those influences, if that makes sense. So yeah, it's a really good question though. Um, so with respect to Southern Mountain Caribou, again, so, you know, there was that 65% that was across all of the critical habitat in Boreal. For Southern Mountain Caribou, it only applies to low elevation habitat. 
and then high elevation habitat can have no disturbance, uh, which is pretty cool. There's not really a lot of like logging that happens at high elevation. So I think in part, again, that's kind of why that was like, okay, that's good. Uh, and then interestingly in Southern Mountain Caribou, matrix habitat isn't managed for disturbance levels. It actually is managed for wolf densities. So in the Southern Mountain Caribou, because it came out in 2014, uh, the, the data at the time suggested that three wolves per 1000 kilometers was the target. Um, so that's what's put forward in the federal um, recovery strategy. And these go through amendments pretty frequently, I would say. Um, so these, these do change as more data becomes available. So uh, it's not to say that this is like set in stone completely. It, it does adapt, which is pretty good, which is good because science changes. So uh, I really wanna talk about this, this 65%. So the inverse of that is that the ranges can only be 35% disturbed, right? And I don't have BC context, but I do have Alberta context. Um, and so these are all of the boreal caribou herds in Alberta. So levels of disturbance across all of those herds. Um, if the goal is 35% disturbed, that's what the red line is. Single herd in Alberta. And if you included Southern Mountain Caribou, it also is very, very disturbed. So it also wouldn't meet this. But you can see that there are no herds in Alberta that meet this level, uh, this target, as of right now, as of 2017. It's only gotten worse. So, <laughs> um, And then for a little bit more nuance, what this graph differentiates between is uh, wildfire disturbance. So that's, that's the green part of the bars is uh, areas that have been hit pretty hard by wildfires, those count as disturbance because caribou don't use areas that have been recently burned for about 40 to 60 years, they'll avoid those areas. Again, because of the same way that, you know, it's the same mechanism as the cup blocks, it's, it's freshly been burned, what's growing back attracts moose, deer, wolves, and so caribou don't use those areas. So it, it is effectively disturbance, right? Um, but you can see it's not good. Um, and Alberta definitely has a long way to go. Um, it means that what has to be a focus for Alberta is restoration of disturbance features, uh, like habitat measures, maintaining what is not disturbed. Uh, and what we strongly advocate for is, are those habitat measures? So protected areas, protect the critical habitat and uh, definitely start doing the restoration. Um, it all needs to happen pretty quickly. Um, and, and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, not, not a ton on restoration. So uh, just to give you another, another kind of way to visualize this is, this is a range, this is called the Little Smoky Caribou Range. This is in Alberta, it's a boreal caribou. You can see this inset here is uh, the entire province. So it's right next to the Southern Mountain Caribou herds that, that do move into BC. So it's pretty representative of what a lot of those look like. Uh, so this is with the buffers. So if you remember me talking about like, is the 500 meters good? If it was any more than 500 meters, like there would just be no hope for this range. <laughs> they would be like, I suspect what would, you like, governments would just give up on the ranges that are too disturbed to meet it, right? Like you would just be like, all right, well, this would be, this is my very pessimistic view. But if all the caribou disappear in this range and they're extirpated, then it's no longer critical habitat because there's no caribou there. So I think that's kind of some of the nuance they were trying to deal with, but uh, this, the, the purple is cut blocks. Um, the orange is temporary disturbances. So those are actually pipelines uh, and roads. Um, there are, <laughs> so this is a 99% disturbed. So you can see in this upper left-hand corner, what is considered undisturbed is only 1% of the Little Smoky range. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very, very busy landscape there. Um, and that, you know, that's in the foothills. It's, it's pretty representative of a lot of Alberta as well. And 
a lot of these green, these green lines that are just crisscrossing everywhere, it, it takes up a ton of the disturbance um, budget. Those are seismic lines. Um, and I'll, I want to talk a little bit about seismic lines. They're really important. There's a ton of seismic lines in BC too. Uh, so I don't have maps for BC, but this does still apply, uh, especially in those northern boreal caribou. And um, it, it's still a very <laughs> big uh, disturbance feature. So seismic lines, uh, this is a map on the right of all of the seismic lines in Alberta. Um, so even at this scale, you can see it's, it's super intense. Um, so in particular, the issue are legacy seismic lines. Um, and seismic lines, they're used to explore for oil and gas potential. Um, legacy lines are really, really wide. They're five to eight meters wide. Um, they all happen prior to the 90s and they were all carried out by the by the energy industry by different companies um they just stretch for kilometers in just like absolutely straight lines um before technology really had developed they they used to just bring a my i so i've heard is that they would just bring a bulldozer in drop it down to like the clay level and just drive and so you, you know, it's tearing up all of the organic material, like it's tearing up all of the soil. It's, um, these are in, remember, these are in wetlands. These are in like really, really um, old, old habitats that they're, they're creating these. And they're not necessarily like a high disturbance because they're only eight meters wide, but they've, you know, when you're doing that at the density and the intensity that was happening uh, when, when there was kind of this exploration boom, obviously really impactful. In Alberta, just when it comes to caribou ranges, there's 250,000 kilometers of seismic lines, of legacy seismic lines in, uh, in Alberta. It's massive. <laughs> and what I want to note about what makes it really difficult from a management perspective is that uh, because at the time when the approvals were being issued for seismic exploration, the belief was that it would grow back. And so there weren't reclamation standards, which means that, you know, the companies made them and then it was no longer their responsibility. And they are still, it's this muddy water of whose responsibility these legacy seismic lines are because the companies, uh, you know, many who like don't exist anymore, uh, don't. Are, are, you know, it's like, it's not their responsibility because they're not on, it's not a leased area. Like it's, there's, there's legally nothing that says it's theirs. And the government of Alberta, you know, is, is challenged of, well, it's not theirs responsibility either because, you know, they don't have the capacity, the funding to um, reclaim all of those. But whereas maybe oil and gas companies do have that capital to spend on it, but don't really want to. And so that's where from a management lines and the restoration that has to happen for them um, is, is super complicated about who has to do that and who funds that. Um, and I just wanted to share a photo. It's a little bit grainy, but um, so I got to do some, some field work in Northern Alberta and spend some time in these areas. And this is an example of a legacy seismic line. Um, this one probably, I think, was about like 40 years old, 40 or 50 years old, and it's not growing back, you can see. Um, and you can see it's like this straight corridor. They're everywhere. They go deep into wetlands. And it's in part what means, um, what brings wolves uh, into the caribou habitat in the boreal. So they just kind of use these as the people have called them like highways, predator highways, um, that, that really makes access into caribou habitat super easy for wolves. Uh, and, and again, you can imagine if those are everywhere, like it's, there just are no safe places for caribou in the boreal in Alberta, BC. And then this is another image from a helicopter of the boreal forest and seismic lines. Um, but yeah, you can see the uh, well pads and the roads that lead to the well pads. But yeah, I just think people don't really, in, uh, any, maybe um, the, the density and the intensity and the just magnitude of the disturbance level in the boreal forest is like is is a lot 
and you can imagine that any this is not close this is not nearly close to what it was uh before all of this happened and how Caribou evolved so I I know it's been a while but I'll just I'll you know it's we're, don't worry <laughs> it's still even more interesting so uh range plans so it's a province has to come up with these range plans in BC they called them herd plans I don't know why there's that nuance um but range plans basically they forecast the habitat uh, and population objectives for the next 100 years in the recovery strategy it basically says you know we expect that recovery on a long term like probably looks more like De it's decadal at this point so 50 to 100 years super long timelines right but uh that's the job of these range plans is to kind of say in 100 years or uh on this long-term scale how do we get to the 65 percent undisturbed and range plans also include short-term mitigation uh activities and and these are ones that are also they're also spelled out in the recovery strategy of like other options uh for like the the simple truth is that it's really bad for caribou and we're likely going to need a lot a lot of things happening at the same time to recover them and a lot of them going to have to be kind of these emergency measures but they have to be coupled with the long-term you know habitat measures uh so i'll kind of go through some of the options and like what <laughs> what are the challenges with each of them? So the first one that like we advocate a lot for is habitat protection. So you can put habitat protection in range plants. You can put forward areas that you think should be uh, protected from industrial disturbance and areas that should be prioritized for restoration. Um, habitat protected air, habitat protection, you know, parks, they're super affected by political will. Uh, so it can, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be like a, bipartisan issue but it does kind of turn into a super political issue especially in in Alberta um so there can be recreation access management so that would mean putting in maybe just seasonal closures it maybe means just managing how many people can get into an area during calving season or through the winter but that can affect tourism and and a lot of areas depend on tourism for their local economies um, habitat restoration can go in range plans, but the most current estimate is about $12,000 per kilometer to, to restore a seismic line. So then if there are 250,000 kilometers of seismic line and it costs 12,000 for each of those, you're getting into potentially an unrealistic budget for how much that restoration would cost. And, you know, can you actually take carry that all out? You can have resource access plans. So that requires industrial and political buy-in. Uh, so that would be something like actually using the 65% as a management target, you know, as if you could say in this area, <laughs> we are already at the 65, like no new development can happen. Um, that affects the energy sector. It affects uh, forestry sector, it affects uh you know economies and so again you need some pretty in good political buy-in you need industry players at those at those tables about what what can uh, be done um there can be predator and prey management which is very controversial um not only i guess you know ecologically in the modeling but also socially very controversial uh, there's not generally a lot of political, there's not generally a lot of uh, social license to carry out like wolf calls. Uh, and those are happening in Alberta. Uh, it's not a super transparent process, but it's happening in BC too. Um, BC does do a little bit more reporting on their wolf calls. Um, but it's definitely not long term. You, there's no way wolf calls can be something that's in the next 50 years, although Alberta has kind of said that's what they're ready to commit to. So super controversial. Uh, and then maternity penning, super expensive. Um, it costs about $125,000 per caribou calf born in a maternity pen. So again, we're, we're, we're walking into like pretty expensive um, measures um, 
and again, we can chat about if there's questions about this stuff. Um, maybe we can have a conversation about that. I just have like one more example to talk about, which I think is really cool. If that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So all the things that go in a range plan. Uh, so how's it going then? Well, there are no range plans in any jurisdiction in Canada that meets the federal recovery strategy. Um, there's a range plan. Actually, you know what? There actually might be one in the Northwest Territories, but okay, maybe one. <laughs> and uh, it's not good. I would say, you know, there's not, there aren't any for Alberta and I don't think there are any for BC. Um, yeah, okay, Alexia's nodding. So it's uh, a really challenging issue. Uh, caribou have to compete with a lot of other different land uses. It's a really, really busy landscape. Uh, and it requires a shifting, a shift in the paradigm of how we manage the land and our resources in the boreal forest. And, you know, it's either we watch caribou go extinct or like we actually start to manage uh, the resource extraction and, and land use uh, in a in a way that benefits the ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of fear in general, uh, especially from more local municipalities where the caribou ranges are. There's a lot of fear that caribou recovery comes at the cost of people's livelihoods. And, you know, that simply isn't true. And there's, but there's a lot of fear about change, right? And uh, I just want to emphasize that meanwhile, you know, caribou are still. <laughs> going are still declining while we kind of uh hum and haw about what's gonna what's the best move forward um in 2019 there was another lawsuit filed by uh, first nations and environmental groups uh to the environment minister to the federal environment minister to put five of the herds in alberta under an emergency protection order so the lawsuit was basically saying you know look, here's all the evidence that Alberta is not doing anything to protect caribou and they're uh, allowing for the destruction of critical habitat. And so they were um, compelling the minister to, to enact this emergency protection order. Um, a few months ago, they settled that lawsuit because a conservation agreement got signed, but uh, it still, you know, speaks to the fact that Sarah isn't really functioning, I think, in the way that it, it, it should be. Um, and then, yeah, in 2020, so last year, the Moline herd in Jasper National Park was officially confirmed to be extirpated. So, you know, extirpations are still happening. They're still in decline. It's still pretty bad. And from a provincial perspective, I was trying to do some digging on, like, what's some good BC context? Uh, BC also isn't doing anything. <laughs> I, know, I shouldn't say that, but there are still ongoing destructive activities in BC. And so this is um, a paper that came out in 2020 um, that found that logging was still continuing to happen in, in, critical, cap, in uh, critical caribou habitat uh, in BC. So they found that there was 909 square kilometers of critical caribou habitat that had been logged in the past five years. Uh, so, you know, Logging is still happening in Southern Mountain Caribou habitat. Um, auctions are still happening. Again, I don't know if you guys have seen a lot in the news, there's kind of lots of stuff where new auctions open up within caribou ranges. And so, you know, I guess those hard decisions haven't necessarily happened yet in BC. Um, and I think it's also worth noting that um, mountain pine beetle also has had a pretty big impact on caribou. And so the mountain pine beetle strategy in BC uh, was to do this like salvage logging, what's called salvage logging. And so that's where uh, you go into areas, into forests that haven't been hit by mountain pine beetle yet, but probably will be, and you salvage log. So you save the lumber from being attacked by these pests and which when they become less valuable. Uh, it kind of changed where that's happening. And all of that was in caribou habitat. A lot of that was in caribou habitat. And so there was a lot of uh, logging of in places that are really important to caribou. Um, you know, then there's like this dichotomy with, with pest management and that really mattered to the, to the forestry economy as well. 
Uh, so this is an example of an indigenous led management approach though, that uh, was uh, happened for the Klimza herd uh, in BC. So it was the West Moberly and Salto First Nations. They've been really prominent leaders in mountain caribou recovery for the past many years. Um, and what they actually did is in 2013, they established a maternity pen uh, for the Klimza herd to save them from extirpation. They were at 16 animals at their lowest. And so basically you take all of the females and all of the calves and you put them in a maternity pen. Uh, so it's a predator free enclosure. It, uh, they, they have indigenous guardians that uh, patrol the perimeter of the maternity pen because wolves have been known to like figure out ways to get in. They're obviously very smart. Um, there also is a predator control program that happens in that area because once the calves are born after a few months, they're released back into the, the herd, into the range. And so again, to like boost the probability that they survive to adulthood, they have a pretty intense wolf call predator control program. And I think they have a prey control program. So I think they also control how many moose there are. I don't know that for sure, but they do have moose control programs kind of elsewhere in BC in that range. Um, so it started seven years ago. They now have more than a hundred animals in that herd. It's been, you know, called, it's a, it's a success for sure. Um, that herd is in stable condition. Another reason it's kind of seen as success, success is because they have a, a partnership agreement with BC and Canada. So it's the two First Nations, BC and Canada. Um, so it's finalized. I know this slide says that there is a draft, but it, it's been finalized um, and signed, which is really great. It actually proposed protected areas um, in the high elevation habitat. And then it had some kind of proposals for the management of different zones for like how much industrial development can happen. Um, so as someone who is watching from Alberta, I saw this partnership agreement come out. They, they released it for public consultation. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. You guys have no idea how rare protected areas, proposed protected areas actually happen for caribou. So it was amazing. Like I was so excited to see this. Oh, it's like indigenous led. This is like a no brainer. This is awesome. And it was horrible. <laughs> Um, the, the local municipalities, I think it was like Tumblr Ridge and Chetwin were, were like really disappointed to see that this partnership agreement was happening, um, without, they felt without consultation from the, those communities because they felt that it would really hurt them and really impact them. So that protected area, you know, it was expanding one that existed already, but it was also means there were concerns about recreation impacts, concerns about, especially about lumber, uh, about forestry jobs. So I just quickly, I honestly quickly just Googled like caribou partnership agreement jobs. And these were like the first news articles that came up. And so it was like a really, it really sparked a lot, a, a really big debate about caribou. And so, you know, saving caribou herd pits conservation against jobs. Um, BC interior residents say provinces caribou plans will lead to forestry job losses. There was a lot of concern, a lot of fear. And I just wanna pull also um, this article. This was in the Taiyi about the, uh, about the Klimzaza herd and about the First Nations maternity pen. And it talks a little bit about this partnership agreement that happened and how honestly like super racist the, um, Push, but it was it was a lot of blaming these indigenous communities for um, job losses and a lot of some pretty violent vitriol came out of it directed at the those chiefs and at those communities. Um, so in in the final agreement, I'll, maybe I'll just read it. So in the final agreement, in the final partnership agreement, there's a section addressing the racist backlash from those fearing job losses. Uh, Wilson says indigenous communities have unfairly become a target for forestry's long-standing decline. So the caribou thing happened and then forestry companies were able to divert people's attentions to the caribou and take pressure off of them for mismanagement of the forests. Uh, while Donaldson acknowledges that a high level of concern in the local communities uh, that rely on forestry and other resource extraction, he says that the forest industry claims that 500 jobs 
would have been lost and that that was overblown. Uh, and so, you know, there's been a lot of misinformation on the impacts of the agreement. Our ministry staff have worked with the forest sector on the impacts of the protected area that's in the agreement and collectively we've agreed that the impact would be about 280,000 cubic meters of timber, which is not a lot to a timber company. And the best part is, is that the province negotiated a $40 million financial package with the feds uh, for impacted tenure holders in that area anyways, and then a $10 million uh, agreement for the communities and potentially impacted workers. So, you know, <laughs> there is room for, I guess, you know, I guess it's to say that there is room for collaboration and understanding and like solutions. Um, but that was a really interesting thing that happened. And that's it for me. I know I talked for a really long time, but I would be happy to have a discussion about anything that came up here. And this is my email too. I'll leave that up for people. I also, you know, can you can send me an email and ask for anything. <laughs>